I'm Andrew Natsios. I'm director of the Scowcroft Institute, and I'd like to introduce our speaker this evening. Abdul Karim Sarush is a leading philosopher in the Muslim world. He was born in Tehran, Iran, studied pharmacology, chemistry, and the philosophy of science in Tehran and in London. He joined the anti-Shah movement in the late 1970s and went back to Iran after the 1979 Islamic Revolution. The Ayatollah Khomeini appointed him as a member of the Cultural Revolution Institute, but within a few years he submitted his resignation and gradually has merged as one of the most outspoken challengers of the Islamic system. He was removed from his teaching positions at the University of Tehran, barred from giving lectures, persecuted, and nearly assassinated by government agents. Throughout the Islamic world, he has been venerated and reviled for his support of religious pluralism and democracy. He has been named as one of the top 100 most influential thinkers by Time Magazine and Foreign Policy. Dr. Sharous has been a visiting professor at Harvard, Columbia, Princeton, and Georgetown University, among others. Uh, if you read uh, the current president of Iran's, uh, Mr. Rouhani's um, memoirs, he talks about a boat trip he took with uh, Dr. Sarous to Paris to meet with the Ayatollah Khomeini in 1978 as the revolution is picking up speed in Iran. And I don't I don't know if you read the, the, the memoirs, but you're mentioned extensively apparently in that conversation because you already had a diversion view of the revolution than the leadership did. At the height of the Iranian Green Movement, if you remember, that was the uprising in 19, uh, uh, the second term uh, re-election of the Ahmadinejad they fixed the elections in a really abusive way and there's an uprising, millions of people, Iranians, uh, went to the streets and the regime was actually panicked over a popular uprising, uh, which actually uh, Dr. Sharous, uh, his writing and his, his uh, inspiration in many respects uh, was behind. Um, at the height of the Green Movement and the after aftermath of the re-election of Ahmadinejad, Dr. Sarouche wrote uh, an open letter to the, uh, to the Iran Supreme Leader. <clears throat> Let me read to you extensively from this, because this is one of the most beautiful and elegant defenses of democracy and freedom I've ever seen anywhere in the world. And I've seen a lot of democracy movements as the former head of USAID. We, AID was involved in some of these. And the title of the letter was, Religious Tyranny is Crumbling, Rejoice. And here are some excerpts from that. And, and this letter was written to him, but it was released, so it's a public letter. I know that you are going through difficult and bitter days. You made a mistake, a grave mistake. You showed the way out of this mistake 12 years ago. I told you to adopt freedom as a method. Never mind about its rightfulness and its virtue. You should use it to attain a successful state. Don't you want this? Why do you send out spies and informers to discover what is in people's minds or to use tricks and ploys to make the people tell them something against their will? Why must you listen to reports that are based on information that is obtained by stealth that contains a mixture of truths, untruths, and half-truths? Allow newspapers, political parties, associations, critics, commentators, teachers, and writers to operate freely. People will tell you what's on their mind plainly and in a thousand different ways. They will open the windows of news and views to you and help you run the land and the state. Don't strangulate the newspapers. They are society's lungs. But you opted for erroneous and misguided ways. Now you are cursed with doom. You have fallen victim to the closed system that you created yourself, a system in which Neither criticism nor opinions can grow, a system in which neither learning nor news can flourish. You think that you can obtain full and comprehensive information by reading confidential bulletins and listening to obsequious aids. We are a fortunate generation. We will see religious tyranny crumble and we will rejoice. A moral society in a post-religious state that transcends religion is the shining destiny of the people and the green movement. We will value and esteem freedom, the same freedom that you snubbed and are today paying the price for stumbling. 
The proponents of fascism sold you the idea that freedom means decadence and debauchery. They did not recognize that the cure for deadly diseases of your ruling system lay in auspicious freedom. And we will esteem faith, the very faith that you turned into a plaything in the interests of power. The relig rel religiosity that you used to teach people of grief and servitude. You did not realize that joy and freedom are the true companions of faith. That the compulsions of jurists rob people of the liberty of devotion. That a power that is based on religion corrupts both power and religion. Ruling over joyful, free, knowledgeable people is something to boast about, not over captive, grief-stricken serfs. Dr. Sarush, we welcome you to the Bush School. Good evening. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Professor Nostius and Professor Gass for uh, inviting me here. And thanks, everybody here in this uh, room. And uh, I am also thankful to God who has made everything available to me to be your guest. I have to thank my hosts of uh, their very warm hospitality and the respect I have received and I am especially thankful to Professor Nostius for his very generous remarks and uh, reminding me and you of the content of the letter which has been written four or five years ago. Now, um, <coughs> um, the uh, topic of my talk here, which uh, will be not, hopefully not more than 30 minutes, uh, is about the Islam and the modern politics. I know and everybody knows there are so many misgivings about Islam and its interpretation. Islam as a religion, Islam as an identity, Islam as a salvific religion. There are so many misgivings and uh, I'm not sure that if I can eradicate some of them in my short talk, but maybe in the session of the Q&A, things will become clearer to the seekers of, uh, of truth. Now, I will share with you three main points, and uh, then there are logical consequences of these points, and uh, I will elaborate on it maybe later on in the next session. Um, let me just remind you that, that Islam, and for that matter, indeed, every religion has got uh, three different functions or uh, every religion is the source of three different things. First of all, the religions are the source of truth. Every religion claims to some truth about man, about God, about history, about uh, happiness, about uh, ethics, and so on and so forth. And secondly, um, religions are the source of identity. Although we are living in the age of national identities, but we remember and we still have with it the uh, religious identity. I as a Muslim, you perhaps as a Christian, a Jew, a Buddhist, or whoever. So this is a very strong identity. I will come to that later on in order to elaborate on it more, but every religion is a source of identity. And thirdly, Every religion, of course, is a source of salvation. They, uh, I mean, religions uh, promise you that uh, you will be saved if you uh, follow the edicts of uh, a particular religion. So this is the function of every religion, and Islam is no exception. Therefore, uh, we have got here a system, a package, in which you can find identity, truth, and uh, salvific. Uh, promises. Okay, this is as far as it goes. A second uh, minor point, which is not really minor, is major, but I am not going to elaborate on that a lot, is religion means the interpretation of religion. Christianity does not mean the gospel. It means the interpretation of the gospel. Islam does not mean the Qur'an, it means the interpretation of the Qur'an, and so on and so forth. 
and interpretation is historical. So this is another dimension, because it is not my interpretation, or it is not my generation's interpretation. It is an ongoing business, an ongoing historical business. And this is the meaning of the historicity or historicality of religion. Religion, every religion is born in a particular spot of time. Christianity 2,000 years ago, and Islam 1,400 years ago, and so on. But does, does, that does not mean anything. Religion is like a seed being cultivated, being planted in the soil of history. And then it grows and grows and grows and becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. So uh, this means that uh, every religion, which means interpretation of religion, is historical is an ongoing business, is something which never ends. According to Muslims, the, the Prophet Muhammad was the seal of prophets, okay, but he was, nobody is the seal of interpreters. You have the seal of prophets, but the seal of interpreters have never come and will never come till the end of history. So let us remind ourselves of these very important facts that uh, the book the text itself is silent. We have to make it speak. We have to listen to its voice. And it doesn't speak to you unless you ask him the question. You know, when you put your question to the text, then you will hear its voice. Without having question, without having any queries, you cannot understand what is already there in the text. So you have to make it speak to you. This is very important. People usually forget and they think that religion has got a single essence or it is, uh, has been born in a fixed time and will never come out from its birthplace. Or maybe people think that uh, the interpretation is uh, something literal and uh, it is a fixed interpretation. None of these are true. And I think philosophers of religion and theologians, especially over time, they uh, take it uh, perhaps as a self-evident truth that uh, interpretation is not fixed and it is historical and the text is silent and we have to listen to its voice and uh, listening to its voice means asking it some questions. The questions of my generation is different from the questions of the former generation and the question of the later generation will be different from the questions of my generation. Therefore, since the questions are different, answers will be different, and it goes on and on and on. This is the meaning and the nature of the historicality of uh, religious or scriptures interpretations. Now, uh, this is as much as religion or Islam, including Islam, is uh, considered, and uh, I think uh, it is sufficient for our present purpose. Now, let me come to the modern politics. I have been teaching politics, Islamic philosophy, or philosophy of politics in Islam in Harvard University, in Princeton and elsewhere. And uh, I have been uh, you know, emphasizing two points for my students, which I would like to share it with you here, about the modern politics. Of course, talking about modern politics is, is a huge you know, job, and one cannot do it in one session. But I will just point out two things of the modern politics. The first is the idea of rights. Now, um, this is uh, in the borderline of religion and uh, politics. Perhaps every one of us is aware that the modern politics is a rights politics. It is not a politics of obligations or duties. It is based on rights. And uh, as everybody knows again, democracy is a politics of rights. And uh, if you, uh, I mean, uh, think about it, we are living in a paradigm or an era of rights. The, uh, uh, the, the human rights uh, draft and declaration was made in 1948, and this is very telling. It tells us in which age we live and what is uh, in Hegelian sense, what is the spirit of our age. I personally make a division, a distinction between our age and the former 
or the pre-modern age, as the pre-modern age was the age of obligations and duties. And ours is the age or the paradigm of rights. Such a distinction gives you a lot of information about how to interpret the literature, even religions, and so on. The language of all religions is the language of duties. It is not the language of rights. Take the Bible, take the Old Testament, take the Quran. Uh, you will seldom, very rarely, find the word rights in those books, in those scriptures. Even the, the, the old literature, the ancient literature, the classical literature, the pre-modern literature, the word rights, you seldom find in them. You know, the minds of the people were imbued with the idea of obligation, the idea of duty, the idea of responsibility, which is not bad, very good, but the balance was not there. There was not a balance between rights and duties. The duties were dominant. You know, when you became a mature person, be you a religious person or a non-religious, you first asked yourself and others, what are my responsibilities? What are my duties? But in the modern age, everything tells you and indoctrinates you to ask what are your rights? You know, political rights and individual rights and educational rights, sexual rights, and so on and so forth. Everywhere and in every book, in every declaration, you will see that the rights of people should be respected to the extent that this has become so self-evident to us nowadays that uh, we think that it has been all the, I mean, the case all the time, but it is very modern. This is very modern. At least it is post-enlightenment uh, issue. Whereas uh, if you go back to the uh, you know, pre-modern era, you will see that obligations are the dominant team. The balance still is not with us. Now we are living in an age which rights are dominant over uh, obligations and responsibilities, which is again not very good. You know, we have to reach a balance between the two and exactly this is the task of the religious person and the reformers, to bring us back the, the balance. I tell you and I recount you on a story, whenever I give a, a public speech, let us say in Iran, in some Middle East countries, I mainly put my emphasis on rights. Because I know that the, already the, the minds of the audience is imbued with the idea of duties. I need not, you know, make any case for duties and obligations. They're already aware of it. I have to bring the balance to it. So I, I recommend them to look for their rights. But whenever I give a public lecture here in America or in the West, in Europe, I, I do the opposite. Actually, I remind my audience of their responsibilities. Where are our responsibilities? What are obligations and duties? It is on the verge of being forgotten. On the verge of being forgotten. You know, being a, you know, a, a rights-oriented person is on the verge of selfishness. Because all the time you ask, what are my rights? You are a claimant. You are a creditor. But when you think of your obligations, you are not a creditor. You know, you make yourself humble and you think that there is something that you have to do. You have to do. This is not that you have to claim. A claimant person I mean, all over the time is not, is not, it gives you, you know, a kind of egoistic selfishness which is uh, morally wrong, of course. So this is a very important thing. Dictatorship means ruling uh, over the people who are mainly uh, obligation-minded, whereas uh, democracy means uh, ruling of the people who are rights oriented over the people who are rights oriented at the same, same time. Now religions, uh, as I said, are uh, not, their language is not the language of rights. That's why in the modern time religions seem a little bit uh, not in tune with the spirit of age. This is very important. It is not because they believe in God, it is not because they believe in the next life or all these things, of course, are controversial issues. But what exactly contradicts the spirit of the age, which maybe people do not, you know, say it, do not disclose it, but it is in their back of mind, is the contradiction between the language of religion and the language of the modern politics. 
which is the language of rights. So this is a, a, a point which has to be taken into consideration in order to be able to make a fair judgment about the role of religion and the role of modern politics and the relationship between the two and uh, the balance of the imbalance which might uh, emerge because of the neglect of one of the uh, two sides of the uh, equilibrium. Now, uh, this is as much as the rights goes, and the second is the issue of nation states. We are living again in the age of nation states. This has not been the case in the past, as everybody knows here, and uh, the idea, the concept, and the existence of nation states is not more than 200 years old. So before that, we had, in the case of Islam, we had the Ummah of Islam, which means the community of Muslim at large, all communities, without boundaries. And you had here the Christendom, which means the world of Christianity, without the boundaries. The national identities were not yet born, were not yet born, there was no rival to religious identity. The religious identity was the primary identity of the religious people, the members of the religious community. A Muslim meant nothing but a member of the Muslim community at large, which is called Ummah in, in Arabic. A Christian was a member of the Christian community, and Pope actually was, was the, the, the father. Now, uh, of course, in Islam, we do not have a person like Pope, but nevertheless, the membership and the religious identity is there. National identities uh, are newly born things, which um, has been source of some conflicts and some misunderstandings of the role of religion, role of nationalism and so nationality and so on. I remember that during the war between uh, America and Iraq, there were some Muslim soldiers in American army, and they had really problem going to Iraq because uh, they didn't know which of their identities to choose. They had two identities, Muslim and American. On the basis of their Islamic identity, they actually refrained from going and invading you know, a Muslim country. But on the basis of their American identity and their oath to the American army, they had to go. There was a conflict here, and this conflict is very important. In religious societies, it is much more important. But here, since it is, um, let us say, a secular society, so it comes up, but uh, maybe it can be resolved so easily. And there was some of the prominent Muslim clerics who issued an edict, a fatwa, that, OK, they are primarily American and secondarily Muslim. This is a very important, this has never been the case before in the Muslim land. People were primarily, secondarily, thirdly, fourthly Muslims and so on, and nothing but Muslims. No other rival or alternative identity was there. But now it is quite uh, clear that uh, a Muslim, a Christian, a Jew, they have got at least two identities. This is not the case here in America or in the West. It is a case in, in, in Saudi Arabia as well. It is a case in Iran as well. So it is worldwide, uh, I mean, problem, if you like. Because in Iran also, we are Iranians. We have got Iranian nationality. And at the same time, we are Muslims. And then, of course, not only Muslims, we have got Christians, we have got Jews, we have got Zoroastrians in Iran. And they are, again, on the one hand, uh, they have got their own religious identity. and and but, and in addition to that, they have got the Iranian identity. This has created, again, a problem for religions, which uh, I will come to that. And that problem is this. Exactly when it comes to a conflict, when there is some conflict between your two identities, national identity and religious identity, which one is to be uh, the, the, the more important? which one is going to be the uh, dominant one. As you see, for example, in the case of uh, uh, American soldiers, American Muslim soldiers, you see that the problem was resolved by prioritizing of uh, American identity. I know that even in Iran, it is the case. In Saudi Arabia, it is also the case. When it comes to fighting against the enemies, 
It doesn't mean that uh, only Muslims should go. I mean, all Iranians should go to fight against the enemy. I, I remember that in the case of the Iran and Iraq war, you know, Iraq country is a majority country of Shiites, a branch of, of Islam. And Iranians are 90% 90, 90 Shiites, but they're fighting against each other, not because of their religion, but because of their national identity. Iranians were fighting against Iraqis. It didn't mean that Shiites were fighting against Shiites. That never happened. This is very important. Therefore, even in the case of Iran, even in the case of the Islamic Republic of Iran, which has got a clear religious identity, when it comes to these uh, 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 political affairs, and especially the uh, foreign policy, I think identity, sorry, nationality comes first. And this has no precedence in the history of religion, no religion whatsoever. Very important, and for the Islam, it is much more important because Islam is a, a religion which uh, had, uh, I mean, uh, the, the emphatic view of the religious identity. You know, it was the Prophet of Islam who thought that Muslims should be distinct from Jews, from Christians. Therefore, he made their holidays different from the holidays of Jews and Christians. Holiday in Islam is Friday, whereas in Judaism is Saturday, in Christianity is Sunday. He made a distinction between the graveyard of Muslims and non-Muslims. So Muslims should be buried in a graveyard of Muslims and many other things. Therefore, he was very keen on giving and creating a new identity in the history. But nowadays, we, have, uh, we are facing as Muslims, as religious people, a new thing in the modern politics, and that is the nation state. In a nation state, you are a citizen. You are not a member of the uh, religious community. You are not a subject of a particular king. You are not a member of a tribe. You are a citizen of a particular nation state. So uh, this is uh, another thing. Now, let us uh, go further and see these two things, how cooperate, how work together in order to create new questions and new problems for religion, i.e. Islam here, and how we are going to resolve it. First of all, I would like to bring to your attention that uh, an Islamic state has got a clear meaning. There are some people who think that Islamic State does not have any meaning. Yes, it does have a clear meaning. But, but in the context of Islamic Ummah, before nation state, it had a clear meaning, of course. And it did exist, you know, in the Ummah, in the whole community of Islam. But in the time of the nation states, an Islamic State has lost its meaning, you know, absolutely and completely. This is very important to be fair to the history of religion and to be fair to the modern politics. We have to make this distinction. I have seen many of my fellow reformers, my fellow Muslim thinkers, who do not make such a distinction, who do not think historically, and therefore their judgments are so confused and confusing. So let us uh, eradicate this confusion by making things historical. On the one hand, you have got Islamic Ummah, Islamic community, without boundaries, sans frontiers, according to the French. Now, this Muslim community, sans frontiers, yes, it is. it can have a Khalifa, a Caliph, it can have an Islamic state, it is quite meaningful, and it is based on Sharia, and it can be ruled by uh, somebody who is uh, a Khalifa, as I mentioned, and it has been the case in the past, and his main job is to, uh, to apply the Sharia, the Islamic law. That is perfect. And it worked in the time that we had the Darul Islam, the House of Islam, and so on and so forth. And the citizens of this Darul Islam, House of Islam, were Muslims. Were Muslims. Christians, Jews, non-Muslims, they were not citizens. They had their own rights, but they were not like Muslims. They were not treated like Muslims, who were the real citizens of the House of Islam. 
Please do not be surprised, because this is the case now. Even I am not an American. I do not have the same rights as, as you, the American citizens. I am here living here, but I do not. Uh, I cannot work. I do not have the right to elect. I have, do not have the right to be elected. Therefore, this is exactly like the citizenship in the modern nation states. You are citizens of America. I am not a citizen of America. You enjoy rights that I do not enjoy. That was exactly, this is the root of the discrimination between Muslims and not Muslims in the past and Islamic law. And I beg you to understand the rationale behind it. It is very similar to what we do nowadays. But that was in the time of the pre-nation state. Muslims were the citizens. A Christian could not be the ruler of Muslims. Uh, it is like a non-American cannot be a president here. And so on and so forth. The Jews were not you know, the citizens of the Muslims, but they had their own jobs, their own position, their own rights. And I tell you, it was even more fair than what is going on, going on nowadays. In order to become an American citizen, I have to wait at least five, six, ten years and going through a lot of you know, brutal bureaucracy in order to get an American passport. But in order to become a Muslim, suffice you to say two things. God is one, Muhammad is the prophet of God. That's it. You will become a citizen of a Muslim state. You see, no expenditure, no cost, nothing, no bureaucracy, nothing. That was exactly the case in the past. Important. Therefore, but that was the time of the uh, pre-nation state, the Muslim community at large, Darul Islam and, and Khilafah. Yes, there was a caliph and whose job, as I said, was to apply the Islamic law. But what about today? I think everything has changed. Everything has changed. And this is very ahistorical, very anachronistic to read into the law of Islam the emergence of uh, nation state. In the law of Islam, the, this business, I mean the idea of nation state, is not predicted, is not is not seen. It was not in the perspective of the Prophet Muhammad, nor of Jesus, nobody else in the past, to think of the emergence of nation states and to legislate for these nation states. There is no legislation for them. It was inconceivable, uh, uh, an alternative identity, um, you know, in addition to the religious identity, like a national identity. It was inconceivable in the past. But this is the reality today on the ground. So a people like IS, who are thinking of an Islamic state, who are thinking of a Muslim Khalifa, I just want to give you the background. They are absolutely anachronistic. They do not know the history. They do not know the world that they are within. They do not know the world, the, the modern politics. They do not think of the nation state. And because of that, they are actually reviving something which is uh, long dead, which is not applicable anymore. And because of that, they are committing brutalities which is not in its place. So this is one thing. The other thing which I would like to bring to your attention is, uh, please remind me if I'm trespassing my limits, but uh, I have got a few points to make. Sorry, I will make it as brief as possible. So long as you are eagerly listening to me, <laughs> you are encouraging me to go on. <laughs> so it's your fault, not mine. <laughs> <coughs> yes, uh, uh, this is the, the reason and the rationale behind it and the context in which you have to uh, take account of what is going on. The second thing which I would like, um, and I mentioned, I just, I would like to draw the consequences is the idea of rights. Again, the Khilafah, uh, the Islamic State in the past was first and foremost a state of obligations and, uh, and uh, responsibilities. And this is the language of religion, all religions as I mentioned. You are obliged, you, uh, you are responsible, you are duty bound to do this, to do that, and so on and so forth. That was the uh, job of the Khalif. But we are living in the time of uh, human rights. And religions should tune themselves, you know, to the idea of uh, human rights. 
the language of uh, religions should be reinterpreted into the language of rights. We cannot keep the language of obligations and duties anymore. Of course, as I said, and I, I, I repeat and reiterate, that there we should uh, reach a balance between the duties and the, uh, the, the rights. I think it is a fair criticism of the secular state of the West that they put too emphasis, too much emphasis on the idea of rights to the, uh, to the extent of sometimes violating the rights of others, which is not good at all, politically and morally and so on. So religiously thinking, a religious thinker, a religious reformer has got a great task nowadays, and that is bringing together rights and duties and as I said, uh, strike a balance between the two, and that would be a, a good thing. And that is really the place of religion nowadays, to remind us of our responsibilities, not to remind us of our rights, because we are already reminded of our rights too much. So something we need in order to remind us of our responsibilities, of our duties vis-a-vis -vis other people, other nations, and so on and so forth. It's a good, you know, obstacle to, to uh, you know, uh, going extreme on claiming one's right. I remember once I was uh, invited by uh, a gentleman called uh, Hans Kung, a very well-known uh, German theologian who lives now in, uh, in Austria. And by the way, he was a classmate of the former Pope, you know. And he had good stories about his meetings with uh, the former Pope and so on. The Pope who resigned. <coughs> and uh, I was invited by him and there were a, a lot of other people who are mainly former presidents, former prime ministers, out of their jobs, emeriti, you know, all were there. Now, it was a very good community. They were drafting, you know what? Drafting the Declaration of Human Responsibilities. That was their recognition. That was their realization. That, in addition to, and side by side, the Declaration of Human Rights, it is high time to have a Declaration of Human Responsibilities. And they drafted it. They had people from all over the world, all, of, all walks of life, all religions, Buddhists, Muslims, Shiites, Sunnis, Christians, Jews, Hindus, and so, so on and so forth. And the man on top was, of course, the Hans Kung. They drafted the Declaration of uh, Human Responsibilities. And you know what happened? They sent out this declaration to the heads of a state, to many heads of a state. And what was the response that uh, they got from them? We do not apply this, we do not distribute this, because this is the basis and the uh, ground for dictatorship. I quite understand you know, their feeling and their misgiving. Yes, dictatorships in the past always has been based on the idea of obligations. You know, the subjects of the king they're always duty-bound. You have to do this, you have to do that. No rights, no claims. So they, they feared, they were scared of uh, you know, such a dictatorship coming back under the disguise of, of human responsibilities. But uh, whatever the response of the heads of the state, I think they did a very good job. It was highly responsible of them to do this. And I think we have to revive it, and I hope that they succeed in what they did. I do not know of the rest of the story, because maybe it didn't have the rest, and it ended there, and uh, since the, uh, the response was so cooling off <laughs> that they could not you know, uh, continue. But uh, this is our uh, issue nowadays, and this is a, a, a very important job, especially for the reformers and religious peoples, we have to reinterpret religion in order to accommodate rights in addition to, uh, to, uh, <coughs> uh, to uh, obligations and responsibilities. Sometimes when I go to some church here in America and I use and uh, I love to go, especially on some particular days and occasions, 
and I listen to the priest, and I am very keen to see whether his language is still a language of obligations or language of rights. This is a very good test, whether somebody has become modern or still he's living in a pre-modern era. Somebody has reinterpreted the language of religion into a new language, or perhaps he's using the old language. So, and this is a recommendation for you and a guideline for you that uh, uh, when you go to church, I mean, look into the language of the priest and the preacher to see where he lives and what is the uh, age he lives in. Now, let me uh, come to the last uh, thing that I would like to say. I know that, again, I mean, historicality of religion tells us a lot. I know that you have here the word jihad, and jihad means an offensive war against enemies, no doubt about it. And this is what the Prophet Islam actually did and practiced. Again, I mean, there are ample evidence that he entered the war against the non-believers, against the uh, mushrikun, I mean the pagans, against the, um, the, the, the enemies. And uh, this has been, again, an excuse, you know, a pretext for violating human rights nowadays, for invading other people's land, and even for taking some of fellow Muslims as uh, slaves, you know, as it is being done by IS or ISIS group. Let me just make it a little bit clear for you. The rest will be clearer for you if you go back to the books of history and read it for yourself. You know, Prophet Islam was living in a, a tribal life. He was born into a tribe, you know, in, in, in uh, Arab Peninsula, in Arabia, and the life was uh, tribal. And uh, as every historian has mentioned, in the tribal life, the best defense is offense. And that was really what he did, and everybody did. The best defense is offense. Therefore, he legislated the offensive war, not for to eternity, just for the tribal life. If you go back again, and I repeat, to the tribal life in which the Prophet Muhammad was born and was living and was managing his affairs and was actually communicating his message and mission to other people and wanted to live a peaceful life, a peaceful life for a tribe meant to be offensive against the uh, offenses of others. So that was the rule of the time, that was the norm of the tribal life. He never recommended it for non-tribal life. He never recommended it. He never legislated it for an urban, you know, style of life. He never recommended it for nation states. All these are ahistorical, misinterpretations. This is not what I am saying it alone. There are a majority of Muslim scholars who say the same. It is not my opinion. It is not my uh, uh, fabrication, my creation. That is not the case. The majority of Muslim scholars, Sunnites and Shiites, they are of the same opinion. Actually, among the Shiites where I come from, the offensive war after the Prophet Muhammad is absolutely forbidden. It is haram, according to them. It is forbidden. It is a sin to start an offensive war against others, Muslims or non-Muslim, believers, non-believers, pagans, non-pagans, whoever. That is absolutely forbidden. You have to stop at the doorstep of the tribal life, and that was in the past 1,400 years ago. Again, this is my definition of fundamentalism, that fundamentalists are out and out ahistorical. For them, religion has got an essence. And for them, religion means the seed of the religion, which was planted by the prophet. They do not take history, historical context into account. They think that uh, their interpretation is the best interpretation. They take not the history of religion into account, and they put main emphasis on the law, and this is the third point. Islam is an ethical religion. It is not a religion of law. Of course law is there. We have got you know, a big you know, uh, part of law in Islam, 
And law in Islam actually is a very good thing, and I have discussed it and argued about it in some of my writings, that Muslims are very legally minded, and this legal mindedness means that they are very prone to democracy, because democracy is a rule of law. And once you are very legally minded, you are very keen on your duties and what to do, what not to do, what is forbidden, what is permitted, and so on. This is the basis, and this is a very good context for uh, democracy. But, but apart from the law, and in addition to it, and more, much more important than that, is morality. The Prophet himself, Prophet Muhammad himself said, I am here, I am appointed as a prophet to complete the morality. He never said, I am here to legislate some laws for Muslims. He didn't, you know, define himself as a legislator. He defined himself as a moralist. He defined himself as somebody who has come to complete the task of morality. For those who speak Arabic, this is the exact wording of the Prophet of Islam. And this is something which is missing in fundamentalists, fundamentalists of Christianity, of Islam, whoever. They really disregard morality. They disregard, they, they are just, you know, there in order to interpret according to their whims and wishes the letters of law without taking account of the historicality of the context or the, nothing. And that makes such a huge, you know, craziness on their part. Let me, um, I think it's time to, to, uh, to terminate <laughs> my talk. I mean, otherwise, you know, as I said, I will go on and on. Just remind you that uh, religion, after all, is not in the air. It's something in your heart, in your mind, in your hand. Therefore, you, as a religious person, are more important than the religion itself. Because religion is not commanding you. It's not anywhere. It is in your heart, in your mind. And that's why Rumi, the uh, mystical poet of Iran, perhaps the most important mystical poet of the world. And this is not what I'm saying. It's actually, this is what Eric Fromm said and Bertrand Russell said. And they found him one of the best, or perhaps the best, uh, mystical poet. He was a dedicated Muslim, a dedicated Muslim, a Muslim. Pre-modern, you know, his mind was not, let us say, contaminated or polluted by modern ideas. He was, you know, living in the right age of Islamic tradition and Islamic culture. I just want to share with you and remind you of two verses of him which he tells us about the nature of religion. Uh, I don't read it in Persian, although, I mean, it makes it very lyric and musical, but I just give it, uh, give the meaning to you. He says religion is like a rope. It de- a rope, a cord, it depends on your desire. You may take it and go down to the bottom of the well, or you may take it and come out from the well. So it all depends on your will, your wish, your intention, and your desire. Therefore, clean your desire. Then you will become a very good uh, religious person. And this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, the rest will be in the Q&A. Thank you again.
I, I uh, would just begin by pointing out that Hans Kuhn is regarded as a very liberal Catholic. He is not on the traditional side of Catholicism and was under some criticism within the yeah. hierarchy of the Catholic Church for his liberalism. He was, so, he was, he was a classmate of Benedict XVI, yes. but not a friend of Benedict not a friend. XVI. <laughs> <laughs> I think Benedict's job when he was under John Paul II was to suppress yes. uh, Kuhn's writings, yeah. <laughs> if anything. So it's interesting that, uh, that you, you quoted him in this particular yeah. way. Mm. How, why is there such anger and hostility to your writing from the fundamentalists, not just in the Shia community, but also in the, in the Sunni community? Why are they so angry about and they're so threatened by your, your, um, your writings? Well, uh, First of all, I mean, not everybody is uh, angry against me. There are people who are so friendly and so, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, they're here I this mean, evening. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, and I make friends, you know, wherever I go, yes. you know. So, uh, it is not the case that everybody does not like my ideas. But you are right. There are so many of them who do not like my ideas and who, you know, uh, work against me write against me and they are very angry about my writings and my ideas. It is because, uh, you know, I quite, I quite understand that we are in a state of transition, you know, and in a state of transition there are a lot of, uh, you know, confusion. People really do not realize who is uh, really their friend or who is their foe, and therefore they confuse and mistake their friends uh, from uh, their uh, enemy. I think most of this uh, antagonism, if I may uh, say, is because of the confusion. They understand, I think, not only in my country, but in the whole uh, Muslim world, where my uh, writings and ideas have been translated, have been spread, they somehow feel that uh, we have to have a radical change because some of the changes or reforms which have been like bits and pieces here and there does not work, will not do. And they f understand that some sort of reform is to be expected and is necessary to be made. But they are not yet sure and certain where it should come, who is the right person to tell them what is the right reform in the interpretation of religion or Islam in this particular case. Therefore, I am not all that very upset with these oppositions and antagonisms and um, inimical confrontations and so on. I know that within, let us say, half a century, we, I mean, as Muslim countries, we will be in a very different state of mind, a very different you know, understanding of our religion. And as I said, interpretation is an ongoing business and this is because, and I may remind you of another thing that uh, my enemies are very visible and vocal. My friends are not very visible and vocal. And uh, this is the case, but since I look at both sides, I am not very disappointed. And I think that one has to continue with what he does. It's like exactly the, some of the, uh, the minority, extreme minorities in Islam who are very visible and very vocal like, uh, for example, this IS in Iraq and some others in Afghanistan and elsewhere. Whereas the majority of Muslims who are the silent majority, they do not like them, they do not believe in them, they you know, actually reject them. But they are very vocal and uh, because of that everybody sees them you know, and think that they are the representative of the community of Muslims, the whole majority of Muslims, whereas they are not the representative. They are very tiny, tiny, tiny minority, which are actually next to nothing. But nevertheless, because of their, you know, activities and very brutal activities, which is really uh, uh, horrible, they make a case in the eyes of people and think that they are the, really the important part of the Muslim uh, world. So let us not look at the minorities who are vocal and visible. Let us look at the majority who are not vocal and not visible, but they are the bulk 
of the of the population and they are the makers of history these tiny tiny minorities they are not makers of history i assure you <laughs> great yeah uh, i think that if if a mainstream islamist not these people in the islamic state right not the more extreme elements in in iran but a mainstream islamist sunni or shia would say that in many ways i agree with you completely that the project of, of our movement of Islamic politics is to redress this imbalance of rights and obligations. That what we seek to do in, in a world where rights have run rampant hmm. right, is to reintroduce obligations based on our understanding of our religion and return those obligations to the public sphere. And, and I do think that, that mainstream Islamists, if you want to use that term, on both the Sunni and the Shia side have at least intellectually made their peace with democracy in the world of rights. Right? Uh, we can question what the ultimate goals of the Muslim Brotherhood in many of the Arab states are or, or uh, many of the, of the Shia political groups in Iran, in Iraq, in Lebanon. But they're willing to play the democratic game for the most part. Right? They haven't really been tested, except maybe in Iran, as to, as to how serious they are about respecting democracy. But they're willing to play the democratic game. But it's the, the, the green movement actually green, yeah. showed over seriousness. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So it seems to me that you think that, that this synthesis of an, of an understanding of Islam that accommodates rights, but mm. also emphasizes obligations uh, for public morality is, in the end, not possible. Am I, am I ris misreading you? Not possible, no. I think it is, uh, it is possible, and we have to make it possible, and I think there is every evidence and every reason to think that it is possible. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be for the good of the humanity, actually, to bring uh, such a synthesis of rights and obligations, and not to neglect any of them, to make one of them, as you said, rampant, and dominant uh, and uh, become brutal, actually. Mm -hmm. So I think it is possible, and I think it is the, uh, the task and the responsibility of uh, religiously minded people, religious thinkers, actually to show the possibility and uh, to demonstrate a third paradigm. Mm -hmm. Actually, this is what I am working on. At the moment, I am not going to, uh, to disclose my secrets because <laughs> I have come to a third paradigm and I will publish it later on, which is neither a paradigm of rights nor a paradigm of uh, obligations. And I have made a Hegelian synthesis, mm -hmm. you know, in the sense that you elevate both thesis and antithesis at the same time accommodate both mm -hmm. of them. I think it is possible and we have to find a third paradigm. I think both paradigms have been tested in history and each one of them has got their own drawbacks and mm -hmm. deficiencies. But, and it is, uh, as far as my um, you know, experience tells me, my thinking tells me it is possible and uh, we have to work towards it collectively, individually. And that will be a very bright future, I hope. Mm -hmm. Do you see anywhere in the Muslim world where there might be hints that this synthesis is, can be achieved politically? No, no because uh, I mean, a third paradigm, you know, there are things that uh, can be there without having a counterpart in your mind. Mm -hmm. But there are things that there cannot be there unless you have originally and already thought about it. I mean, we can have electricity here without knowing that electricity is here. But freedom is something that first it comes into your mind and then it will be translated into action. A third paradigm is also like this. I, um, I am not boasting, I'm sorry, I am not a selfish person, but I have never seen any of my fellow reformers who are thinking on the same line, mm -hmm. line of the synthesis of rights and obligations. <laughs> Wherever I talk to them and I uh, go to them and we have chats and, uh, you know, discussions and things, I remind them that please, you know, think on this line. This is something which eventually will manage our affairs. This is something which eventually make a reconciliation 
between religion and modern politics and modern world. Yeah. This is an extremely ambitious project philosophically, <laughs> and we, we look forward to the Thank book. You. And I'm glad you didn't tell us exactly what was in the book, so we'll all go out and buy it when you, when you, when, when you write it. But I'm going to ask you to be a little more specific about the political context now. Can you see, can you see within the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, an evolution toward a, a, a better balance of rights and obligations that is more democratic and perhaps less authoritarian? Can you see in the model of an Indonesia hmm. or, uh, or a Tunisia, where, where uh, yes. uh, Andrew's heading off to, 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 uh, to help Arab oversee Spring, the, yeah. the elections, mm -hmm. where this balance between obligations and rights through a democratic process might be achievable in the Muslim world? Um, in the Muslim world or in Iran, let me, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, speak about Iran, which is, uh, which, uh, of, with which I am more familiar. I think in Iran, yes, we will have a very prosperous uh, future. And this is not just a wish. I think it is a, a hope which has got its own mm -hmm. basis. Um, look, um, about 17 years, 18 years ago, we had Mr. Khatami as of a president. Mr. Khatami was a really uh, a sincere, uh, I mean, freedom seeker, a sincere Democrat, somebody who knew Western philosophy, who knew democracy, and really, really he wanted to implement it. Of course, there were obstacles and hindrances, and eventually he did not succeed did not succeed in, in the sense that he could not actually build and construct a full democratic state in Iran because of the limitations that he had to experience because of, of, of the constitution, Islamic constitution mm. in Iran, and also the pressure groups, you know, mm. we had all over the place. And uh, so he had to submit and surrender eventually to them. He wanted to make, you know, a breakthrough in the foreign policy of the country. He wanted to make something new in the domestic and so on. But uh, remember that uh, during his uh, eight uh, years term, I was not able to meet him, although we were very close mm -hmm. friends, and he did not want to meet me because it created a lot of problem for him. Just meeting with a um, um, harmless person like me. <laughs> but uh, that was, you know, the case. We met when his term, eight years term, was uh, over, even not in Iran, in Germany. Mm -hmm. You know, I was in the Wissenschaft College in Berlin as a fellow for two years, and Mr. Khatami was invited by the same uh, uh, colleague, and so he came, he went there and came there together, and so he delivered the talk. There we actually met after eight years. Mm -hmm. This I mention in order to tell you the amount of the pressure was on him and he had to work under such a very, very limited uh, space. Now, uh, but, but his tradition is there, his legacy is there. Never think that since he was politically perhaps uh, unsuccessful, perhaps defeated, that there is no legacy, there is no uh, uh, tradition. No, I think he had his own people around him. After all, there were 22 million people who voted for him. That was absolutely unprecedented in the whole history of Iran after the revolution and before the revolution. Before the revolution, we didn't have any real elections. And after the revolution, we had some fake elections, but Khatamis was really one of the real ones. And the people actually showed themselves and demonstrated uh, and uh, publicized actually their, uh, their uh, desires. And as I mentioned, and uh, Professor Nostius uh, here read out to you, this is what I wrote to uh, the Supreme Leader, Mr. Khamenei, that let people tell you what they want. Do not send, you know, informants and spies and so on in order to mm. extract, you know, what people have got in mind and uh, tell you in a distorted way. So people really, uh, and whenever there has been a, a real a free election in Iran, people have heavily, you know, tended and inclined mm -hmm. towards democracy. And this 
tells you about the mindset of the people. Now, in the case of Mr. Rouhani, who is the current president, well, again, I am a good friend of him, and uh, we had a, a trip together from England, um, where we were both exilees, I could say, yeah. to Paris when uh, Ayatollah Khomeini was in Paris, and I met him, he met him, and on the way to Paris, you know, we had a long discussion. Apparently, Mr. Rouhani has mentioned this. Uh, I haven't read his, uh, his account, but I have heard from my friends that he has mentioned our discussion about the possibility or impossibility of a religious state and mm. so on. And actually, about 35, 36 years ago, I reminded him of the impossibility of such a thing. Now he's in power, and I am sure that he remembers what I have told him. Mm. And I am sure that also, he, although he's not like a Khatami, because Khatami was really um, um, uh, somebody who, who was sincerely looking for democracy, and he was really well versed in the theory of democracy. I don't mm -hmm. think that Mr. Rouhani is like him. He's not at least as intellectual and as educated in, in modern politics as uh, Khatami was. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, uh, he has made a long way from his original uh, position as a cleric and I think at least uh, if not for the sake of uh, the value of freedom or democracy, if not for the uh, necessity of, he, he is for democracy because he thinks that it's a very good method for ruling, for mm -hmm. governing. And this is what makes me so hopeful uh, about the future of Iran. But about the rest of the Muslim world, I think, well, it depends on which country you, uh, you speak about. In Indonesia, I think it is different, but in Pakistan, for example, it is, uh, it is tragic, it is horrible. Nevertheless, I would like to tell you that uh, as far as I understand, and after the Arab Spring, actually, I wrote you know, a long letter to the Arab nations. It was, in, uh, I mean, uh, translated into other languages as well. I brought to their attention and reminded them that democracy does not mean parliamentary election. The heart of a democracy is an independent and powerful judiciary. This is very important. Sometimes I see even here, you know, if America is a democracy, it doesn't mean that you have got free elections. Of course you have. But the most important element and constituent and con component of democracy is the independent judiciary. You know, Every American thinks that he has or she has got a, a supporter, and that is the judiciary. It is there in order to, you know, uh, claim his or her rights. This is what is lacking in most, if not all, Muslim countries nowadays. The uh, independent, powerful judiciary. This is my first-hand experience in Iran. We never had never had up to this day. And I know that in Saudi Arabia it is not the case. Mm -hmm. I know, but, and this is a big but, fortunately in Pakistan, although there are tribal fightings against each other, but more or less they have got an independent judiciary, which is, a, 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 what to call it, a, a legacy of, of the British rule, mm -hmm. you know. Very important. Sometimes they take, you know, their president into account, into task, and they, you know, try him. This is something which we had we never had in Iran, and nobody thinks that it is ever conceivable to do this. And this means that the, an independent, powerful judiciary is the heart of democracy, and therefore, in order to gauge where you have got a good democracy or not, do not go for the free elections, do not go for the parliamentary elections, and so on. Go for the judiciary. If there is a powerful judiciary, then you have got a good uh, democracy. I think there are very good reasons in Islam, and again, I bring in Islam to tell you that there is a whole you know, lot of laws about the independence of judiciary in Islamic law. Mm -hmm. you know, People think that Islamic law means just amputation of legs and so on. That is not, I mean, for the sake of uh, God, I mean, <laughs> uh, remember that that is not the case. What is the case is this. You have got a whole lot of laws in Islamic law, Islamic Sharia, about the independence of judiciary. 
we had in the history of Islamic law, in the time of Khilafat, you know, in the time of Islamic State and the Muslim Ummah, that the judges were absolutely independent from the Khalif. Even they sometimes summoned the Khalif to mm. their court in order to rule on them, in order to try them, in order to uh, even sometimes condemn them of what they were doing. In the time of the Ottoman Empire also you had the same thing. All this now is obsolete. All this now is forgotten, unfortunately. And uh, Islamic law is, uh, you know, sometimes seems to be only about, uh, you know, the penal law. And the penal law is uh, something which belongs to the old past. So I think, uh, and this is again one of the things that I uh, try to do, and I am writing about it a lot, and uh, I am, uh, I mean, happy that some people have taken it very seriously, that go for the judiciary, go for the judiciary, and think about it. Even I have, <coughs> you know, contrary to all constitutions, I mean, in the world, contrary to all constitutions, I have suggested that we in Iran or in the Muslim land, we have to have an independent judiciary election, you know, because everywhere now, even in the Constitution of America, judiciary and, the, you know, the, the, the whole council of the judges, they are not going to be elected by the people that are being appointed, they are appointees. But since of the graveness of the, of the problem, I have suggested in my writings to Iranian people and to Muslim people that please, besides the uh, parliamentary election and presidential election, have and, uh, you know, uh, 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 consider and insert such uh, an article in the Constitution that perhaps the judiciary election also should be a third one mm. in order to make it absolutely independent. Should we go to the, yes, to the audience for questions? Take questions no. now? Are there any questions? Hello, my name is Mary Mooney. I'd like to welcome you once again to the Bush School. Yeah. Uh, on your on your theory between uh, finding a balance between rights and uh, and duties, I w uh, what comes to mind as an American is some of the hot political topics here in America between. Uh, mostly Christian uh, duties and, and finding the rights for others in that, such as abortion, death penalty, gay marriage. And um, in thinking about that, I was wondering, are there some religious duties that are uncompromisable uh, to, to balancing out with rights? And if so, how do you think that uh, these uncompromising situations will play out in the future, not just in Islamic states who are also trying to find this, but is there a common thread that all nation states will be going through um, as rights become much, only more solid in the future? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I mean, in the case of Christianity, I'll know, for example, abortion now is, is a case uh, um, which uh, uh, is controversial and uh, people have got different opinions. Some people argue for the rights, rights of the mother, you know, for abortion, and some people would uh, argue on the basis of some Christianity, you know, edicts and teaching that perhaps it is forbidden, it is a sin. So, yes, you have got there a conflict of right and obligation, and there are so many like this. But I give you a, a very important uh, example in, in Islam. Um, this is again one of the main cases of the conflict between the rights and the uh, duties. Mm -hmm. You know, both in Christianity and in Islam and Judaism, being a religious person is a duty, it's not a right. It's not a right. You have to be a religious person, otherwise you uh, is a sinful person. You know, and if you leave your religion, if you leave, abandon your religion, you have committed a sin again. Well, the reason is different in different religions. For example, in Christianity, according to Thomas Aquinas, he thinks and he writes quite explicitly in his book uh, that uh, any faith, any religion is a kind of uh, a, a contract with God, if you're an oath with God a pact with him or whatever you call it. And if you abandon religion, you have violated, 
you know, your promise, your pact, you know, unilaterally. And because of that, you have to be punished. And uh, therefore, your, your duty is to remain religious, is to keep your religion. In Islam, you have got the same. It is only in the modern time that being religious is a right, is not a duty. You can, you know, uh, go for any religion and at any time you may, you know, just leave uh, behind your religion, become an atheist, become a non-religious person or whoever. From Christianity you may go to Islam, from Islam you may come to Christianity and so on. So this is because religiosity, being a believer, is a right in the modern time. It was not like this in the past. Therefore, there was a punishment for the person who left his religion and became an unbeliever. Now, the punishment for the unbelief, both in Christianity, in the classical Christianity and Islam, is death penalty. And that was it. You have it in Islam and you have it in Christianity. Even in Christianity, it was even harsher. And uh, I have to remind you that, uh, fortunately, the Inquisition institution, we didn't have such a thing in Islam. But in the history of Christianity, of course, there has been such a thing. I am not denying that there has been some death penalty for apostates, let us say, in Islam. But there has never been, you know, a pope or an institution headed by the pope in order to persecute, you know, the non-believers and to take them into the court and then to burn them at stake or to uh, execute them and so on and so forth. So this much, of course, is uh, to the credit of the Islamic societies. But anyway, the death penalty is there. And this is the obligation of the state. It is the duty of the state. If somebody is a heretic, if somebody is an apostate, to uh, apply the death penalty on him or her, or her. So this is in the, in the body of law, in Islamic law. This is in clear conflict with the modern you know, uh, human rights. It is your right to be religious. It is not your duty. So still in Iran and in some Muslim countries, they have not resolved the conflict. They have opted for the duty, for the obligation of uh, executing the apostates. And uh, we, I mean, uh, um, I have written about it and many others, that this can be no longer the case. Apostasy or being a believer is a right, is not a duty. Therefore, no punishment, nothing. And this is uh, uh, an idea which is gaining ground, I think, in, in most of the Muslim countries. In Iran, I tell you, although there are so many executions, maybe in heart, sometimes they execute somebody because of apostasy, but they never say it like that. They, you know, fabricate some other sins or some other, mm -hmm. you know, offenses in order to uh, justify their action. And this is because of the dominance of the language of rights. Mm -hmm. Other questions, other please, questions? sir? Thank you again for coming. Uh, my name is Charlotte Carlson Willis. Uh, talking about your idea of the silent majority of Muslims out there um, and looking at what has been seen as kind of a brain drain after the Iranian revolution um, and other revolutions and speaking of the judiciary, Ms. Shireen Abadi, who eventually, although wanting to stay in Iran, had to leave. What would you see as an impetus for that silent majority to be able to overcome the very loud and vocal extremists uh, in that current part of the world? Well, uh, actually, uh, we are encouraging, you know, the silent majority to be more vocal, you know, and they have become more vocal. But unfortunately, the despotism, the dictatorship, you know, this is another calamity, another disease that we are uh, inflicted with, unfortunately. That does not, you know, allow the silent majority to become more vocal, to, to abandon their silence. So in order to solve one problem, we have to solve many problems. We have to actually uh, 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 go about the whole system in order to make some radical changes to allow people for, uh, you know, for them to freely express themselves and to be, 
But in addition to that, unfortunately, some of the Muslim countries, although they say the opposite, but uh, I mean, in a surreptitious, clandestine way, they are supporting these terrorists. This is very unfortunate. And uh, that is another reason why the silent majority cannot be vocal, because they do not allow them. Because, as I said, I mean, in a hidden way, in an invisible way, they are supporting the same thing because it is to their interest, unfortunately, to do that. Together, maybe sometimes with Western powers. So we have got a very complicated, you know, situation. As far as their religion and politics is concerned, people like me, we are actually just making people aware of their religious duties. You know, after all, this is a religious duty to stand up against, you know, brutality, to stand up against violence. It is not only your right, it is your duty to that. Therefore, we are going to remind our fellow Muslims to, uh, to remind them of their religious duties, not to be silent, but we know their limitations. We know that within the Muslim countries, unfortunately, there are restrictions on freedom of expression and there are national interests, let us say governmental, because there is no national governmental interest, state interest, that forbids them from expressing their views. But I tell you and I assure you that the heart of the majority of Muslims is not with them, is against them, although sometimes they may not be able to express it. Let me just add, mm -hmm. uh, from a developmental standpoint, because that's the, mm -hmm. my discipline, if you asked officers at the World Bank or at USAID, my old agency, or DFID, the British aid agency, or UN agencies, the most difficult part of democracy building is independent judiciaries. Mm. We can do elections, we can um, improve the competence of public administration, uh, we can reduce corruption, not, with, not easily, not easily at all. Mm. But the most difficult of all of the many interventions that development agencies do is uh, independent judiciary, and the one that fails the most often is that. Mm. And it's probably because the power structure realizes exactly what you've yeah. just said, mm. which is we can probably manipulate the rest of this, but we cannot manipulate a truly independent judiciary, and so we're not going to let it succeed. And that is a problem because I think you're absolutely right. It is the core of the problem. The rule of law is the essence of an open society. If you don't have it, you don't really have an open That's society. It. The rule of law is the essence and the protector of the law exactly. is the judiciary. Exactly. So you have it. Therefore, just going for law itself does not do. You have to you know, protect the protector of the law. And that is the judiciary. Yes. And, uh, when I was in England as a student, when I lived for some years in Germany and here in America, you know, my personal experience and observations actually uh, led me to this conclusion that the main difference between the democratic countries and non-democratic ones is not the free elections, parliamentary election. It is important. That is the independent judiciary. This is what I have felt it with my whole, you know, uh, person, personality. We only have a, a, a couple of minutes left. Are there other questions? Perhaps if people have questions, they can come to the mic and we can get a couple of questions on the floor. Are there any other questions that people would like to raise? Okay, last question. Um, I was wondering, what do you think in uh, Iran would be like a legitimate or a purposeful uh, role of the clergy? I mean, in a society where you have a balance between obligations and rights, do there, does there need to be a body of people who are the keeper of religion? Um, I mean, does education make one more entitled to speak about religion? Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, uh, the, the, uh, the class of clerics cannot be omitted, cannot be removed, you know, they are there. Even here in the West, not in America, but perhaps in, in, uh, in Europe, especially in France and in Germany, that uh, in the time of enlightenment, they were so antagonistic against the clerics. But nevertheless, the clerics are there, and the churches are there, and they are functioning, and they are attracting people even in, in the most secular countries. Therefore, uh, I mean, religion will be there, and the clerics have got their own jobs and their own functions. 
but as I have argued in some of my writings, you have got at least three types of religiosity. And the distinction is quite necessary in order to have not a fallacious judgment about the role of the cleric in the society. You have got the expediential, you know, uh, religiosity, and then you have got discursive, and then you have got experiential religiosity. Um, clerics is for the uh, non-educated or for the laymen. The educated, they do not need any clerics. They are clerics of themselves. And for the experiential religiosity, which means the spiritual religiosity, I mean, there is no clerics whatsoever. So long as you have got the population who are not very well versed in religion, who are not very educated about religion, nor about some other matters, they need to, to rely on somebody to tell them what to do and what not to do. So this is even stronger in the case of Christianity and Judaism, but not that strong in the case of Islam. Since you ask me about Iran, let me tell you that there is not a single religious practice in which you need the presence of any cleric, you know, in Islam. Whereas, for example, in Christianity, you do have such a thing. For example, if you, have, uh, if you want to have a, a religious marriage, okay, you have to uh, attend the church and uh, there should be a priest to say and to authorize the marriage. You see, to say that I declare you man and wife. Without that, you will not be man and wife, okay? But there is nothing like this in Islam. Everything has been done and performed by people themselves. No need whatsoever for the presence of any cleric. So it is a non-clerical, really, uh, religion. But people go to clerics just sometimes, people who are not very educated, to ask them how to pray, how to fast, and this and that. But the presence of the clerics in religious observations and performances is not necessary at all. Therefore, the role of clerics in the in, in future, especially in the paradigm of rights, or in the paradigm in the third paradigm, under the third paradigm of a synthesis of rights and obligations, I think they will have their own factions as to teach people um, about their you know individual uh, you know obligations, what to do, what not to do. Of course, they are welcome into politics, but provided, and this is my opinion provided they leave behind all their signs of uh, clerichhood, if you like. I mean, their turbans and their clothes, everything. They should become like ev any uh, other person and just enter the uh, public sphere and for elections, even for presidency. Nothing will bar them, nothing will forbid them. Because after all, they are citizens and they have got every right to do what uh, all other people do. Thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate your coming Thank you, dear Professor. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all for coming. Thank you.